So, Dr. Williams, I was kind of hoping that maybe we could start by talking a little bit about MAT medications. We've heard a lot about um, MAT in, in the news and people are talking about it, but I don't know if everyone's really familiar with what MAT stands for and kind of what it means when it comes to treatment. I think there has been more and more coverage, especially in the last year, about the use of medications for treating opioid use disorders uh, in the media in particular, in part because of a lot of interest among congressmen right now and the president, president's office of national drug control policy in expanding access to MAT. And MAT really stands for medication assisted treatment. Some people say medication assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. And the idea, the nomenclature refers to the idea that medications, pharmacological approaches can be extremely beneficial for treating patients with substance use disorders, opioid use disorders in particular. Okay. And, and for, for some in the field, it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about treating substance use disorders, of actually using a medication. And um, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to kind of how that blends into even some of the existing treatment models and the way that we provide care for patients with um, opioid use disorders and, and heroin use. It's, it's a great point and an important question. And often people ask me, why is it called medication-assisted treatment? We don't, you know, you give someone a beta blocker for a cardiac indication, no one calls it medication-assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that term speaks to the, the historical legacy, the influence of abstinence-only approaches of 12-step models to treating patients with substance use disorders. This idea that they shouldn't be taking anything, even right. if they're depressed, they shouldn't be taking an SSRI like Prozac or Zoloft that people should be completely medication, drug, substance free. What we've learned over the last five decades, really if you think back to the beginning with the use of antabuse of disulfiram for treating patients with alcoholism, we've seen decades and decades now of research showing that people have better outcomes with the combination treatment of medications with intensive psychosocial and behavioral treatment with recovery work. So the medications now, if you look at the evidence base for how to treat people, the medications are a core part of the treatment approach. We have clinical trials that look at the use of medications, but most trials, you think about the millions of dollars that go into so double-blind, randomized controlled trials, they're not going to last for more than maybe three to six months. Mm -hmm. There might be a few months of follow-up, a year of follow-up, but it's very hard to have a, a forward-looking trial that lasts for five or ten years to really get a sense of what people respond to best. So medications can be life-saving. They can help give people some protection in terms of time to build a foundation in recovery. But long-term, it often takes a lot of work after someone's been using you know, heroin, opioids, wh whatever it might be, using excessive heavy amounts of drugs for years or even decades. No medication will, will flip a switch and make all of the, the consequences, the problems, the, the challenges that people have run into over the years go away. Mm -hmm. But medications can be life-saving to help people address the problems in their life to regain employment, to reconnect with family, to reestablish social ties, civic engagement. It can protect their ability to do that, protect them from overdose, protect them from relapse. But ultimately people have to put in recovery work where they won't really get into recovery. So when, when you say protect, what, is, what does that mean really that you're protecting the person. What? This is, I think it's taken a long time, and I'm hopeful because I do think that there's been a shift in the last year in particular, going back to last spring when the president, President Obama, announced additional funding for states through SAMHSA to increase the, the use of evidence-based treatment with MAP. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a shift in thinking and understanding that the risks that come with addiction to opioids are different than the risks that come with addiction to alcohol or to other drugs like marijuana or cocaine. And in particular, there are two major concerns. One is overdose. So in particular, if people go into a detox without follow-up with medications, methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, people get detox, they lose their tolerance. Right. And we unfortunately, we know that the relapse rate is, is over 90% within a few months if someone's simply detoxed with no follow-up care, especially no medication-based treatment. So, so if we get someone, um, you know, into a detox situation, they're actually at a higher risk 
um, when they come out of that detox? There are absolutely there are concerns that detox that is not followed with evidence-based treatment is actually increasing the risk of mortality okay. for patients. Detox, uh, really the evidence is for detox as a tool to get people into treatment as a bridge into a Suboxone program onto Vivitrol, for instance, the monthly extended release version of naltrexone. But detox itself is not treatment. It can be used as a tool to get people into treatment. But on its own, if it's not followed by treatment, it actually increases the risk of overdose. That's because when people stop using opioids, they lose a tol their tolerance to opioids. Going to detox at the end of the, the 5, 7, 28 days, however long the taper is, the, the detoxification program is, people have no tolerance at the end. And when people relapse, their tolerance to the rewarding effects of opioids increases much more quickly than their tolerance to respiratory depression, which is the mechanism that causes a fatal overdose. The, the brain, the, the, the switch to keep breathing is turned off mm. if people take opioids beyond their tolerance. And so unfortunately what we're finding is people who have a 10 bag of heroin a day habit go into detox, come out, their tolerance is zero, but within a few days they're back at 10 bags. It might have taken them months or years to get up to 10 bags a day. And, and that's really because, um, you know, the, the person is really struggling to try and get the same desired effects from, from the heroin, but their body can't handle that level. And so they're kind of chasing that feeling, as, as, as we sometimes say, but the, the the body kind of just can't handle that, and that switch gets flipped? I think in some ways that's true, and it, it, there might be part of this where people are chasing that feeling, that initial high mm -hmm. uh, that, that people do talk about. Right. It, but we also know, and it, you know, if you look at the field of alcoholism research, that there's a kindling effect. That's what researchers call it, scientists call it. This idea that the brain sometimes, if people go into to detox, that there are neural changes in the circuitry that if anything could cause almost like a rebound craving or a rebound escalation of drug taking behaviors. And that's why the risk, if people go through detox without following that with long-term medication assisted treatment, they're, they're at a much higher risk, not just of uh, relapse, but overdose and overdose death. Okay, and so I know earlier you mentioned also that MAT is an evidence-based treatment, and I've heard a lot sometimes from the field that we really don't have effective treatments for substance use disorders, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. It, you know, so hands down, we have effective treatments. It depends on how you look at it, though. And the early studies often were looking at complete abstinence mm -hmm. as if nothing else mattered, and that's certainly a goal. But I think in part because of the influence of, uh, and the very helpful influence of harm reduction principles over the last few decades coming out of Europe from all over the U.S. now, we've come to understand that people's quality of life, their level of functioning, their employment can increase dramatically, can improve dramatically in successful treatments, even if there still might be intermittent or rare substance use. So now our emphasis is not just on consecutive weeks of abstinence as an outcome, but also looking at retention and treatment, looking at mm -hmm. reductions in use, reductions in uh, heavy use days, heavy drinking days, for instance, uh, but also focusing on level of functioning and quality of life. When you look at patients with opioid use disorders who are on Suboxone, on Methadone, on Vivitrol, the extended release form of Naltrexone, mm -hmm. We know that they are uh, at much lower risk of death, all-cause mortality, and overdose mortality. We know that they are much more likely to regain employment, and we know that they use opioids at a lower rate. Some people still use drugs, still use opioids off and on, but we know the rates at which they use drugs are much, much lower if they're on something like methadone, on Suboxone, or on a blocker shot like Vivitrol. Thank you.